I'm thrilled. I've got Berkeley Hudson uh, Professor Emeritus at the Missouri School of Journalism, uh, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, and he's got a fantastic book. Uh, I couldn't wait to, to, to talk about it. I mean, I've been talking to him about it probably for about three or four years now, but it's finally out. And it's Owen Pruitt's um, Possum Town. Hey, Berkeley, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's great to see you. You too. How did you come across these fantastic photographs? They're so meaningful, they're powerful, and they're, they're rare. Right. So um, I grew up in Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, it's where my relatives have lived for like 150 years. Um, I was a journalist in high school, a photographer, and then also in college. And some other friends of mine were photographers in college. And one of them was doing an oral history project on uh, Catfish Alley in the 1970. That's a black strip of businesses, kind of like uh, Sweet Auburn in Atlanta or in Harlem. You know, and so as part of that, he was looking for pictures from the uh, 20th century. And he went up to the uh, photography studio, Calvin Shanks' photography studio. Well, Calvin was the assistant for many years to Otis Noel Pruitt, Owen Pruitt, who mm. I like to say was the picture man for our town. And he was a white guy. Uh, and he made my picture when I was a kid for like till the time I was about 10 years old. But so my friend who went up up to the studio after Pruitt had died, Pruitt died in 1967. He was born in 1891. Um, so my friend Mark Gooch uh, went up the stairs, uh, these wooden stairs, on the second floor, and he saw all these boxes and boxes and boxes, what we call pasteboard boxes and wooden crates filled with negatives. They were off gassing and smelling like vinegar. And so he asked Shanks, what was this? And he said, well, that's all of Pruitt's negatives. Wow. And so uh, Mark and Bernie Imes, another photographer friend of ours, we went up there and we're looking at them. And we begin to realize this is an incredible treasure trove of photographs, what I now call a photobiography of our town that tells stories in ways that no other uh, records do, visual stories. But we didn't really realize what was there, but... Uh, we kept asking Calvin what he's going to do. He says he's going to make a calendar, but that never happened. Calvin died, and then his widow passed, on, sold the collection to a guy that liked train pictures. So in 1987, like what train, oh, you know, the, locomotives. Oh, the L, L was, and, and, and is there are there quite a few in this collection or something? Well, in the book, there, I think there's one one really nice picture of a locomotive with a bunch of people standing around with the smokestack you know, yeah, bellow yeah. smoke. So we, we got the pictures in 1987, and our goal was to preserve the collection, to research it, to exhibit and publish it. It's just only taken me 35 years to do all that. This A lot of this research was before Google. But what was amazing, even from the beginning, as we've been to sift through, you know, the negatives and the prints, we started to see this is an amazing range What's unusual, it's, it's an unusual collection that is a comprehensive collection of a small southern town, yet at the same time, it reflects the history, not only of Mississippi and the American South, but um, uh, America as a nation, as a whole. And the photographs from this time period, the Jim Crow era of Mississippi, actually connects with everything, things that are going on right today. So... The five of us, white boys who grew up together, young men, we just we 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 saved them, and you could say from the dustbin of history. But we had no idea what we had gotten until we started to look at the pictures, and that's why the book title has in it trouble and resilience. Mm -hmm. And there's both incredible trouble, horrific trouble, but also amazing resilience, joy. Sub sublime grace that just is, you know, touching. What did you learn about Columbus just looking at it through the lens of, of, of Owen Pruitt? Well, myself and my friends, we found stories that we had never been told before, both stories of beauty and grace and stories of horror and racial violence. And those were in the pictures. And, you know, we didn't find them right away. 
and we didn't Pruitt didn't leave behind really any many notes. I mean, there's some people's names on them sometimes, but so it's not like he had a diary or a journal. So, I mean, I spent 10 years trying to find out just who one person was. For example, there was a picture of a, a black man in a overalls with a mule outside a farmhouse. Well, it took me 10 years of just talking to people, reading newspaper articles from the original files to find out his name was Sylvester Harris. Sylvester and his brother they had like a 130, 100 acre farm south of town, but they couldn't make the mortgage payments during the Depression in 1934. So Sylvester rode to town, got on the phone for 90 minutes to the White House, and he reached the White House. And he reached Franklin Roosevelt and told him the story. And Roosevelt says, I'll help you. Well, Pruitt took the picture of Sylvester and his mule. And I just seen this picture. I thought, well, I wonder who this guy is. You wow. know, and after 10 years, I found that story. So Sylvester went viral in our parlance. Pruitt took a picture. That picture ended up in the local newspaper, the Commercial Dispatch. But then it ended up in the New York Times, the New York Herald Tribune. But importantly, it ended up in the black newspapers, the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore paper, the Atlanta World. So I like to say that the white press brought the, the world the attention of who this guy was, but it's truly the black press that celebrated him as a spunky folk hero who gave hope during a time of great sadness and, and fear during the Depression. Newsreels wow, came to what an him. exercise in reporting. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here at the world's best journalism school, so I got to talk about that. What, <laughs> like, the report, the, did you say 10 years to figure, to yeah, figure out who this guy I would just take the picture around town and show them to everybody. You recognize this guy? <laughs> no, no, no. And then I say, well, you know anybody that had mules? Yeah, I know a fella that raised mules. You go talk to him. So I talked to this white guy, Billy Thompson. He had many mules, but he, you know, he didn't know who it was. So <laughs> but eventually I found a picture on the front page in March 1934, the front page of the local newspaper, and it had AP photograph. You know, and Pruitt took the picture and AP distributed it around the country. So and also Memphis Many wrote a blues song, Sylvester and his mule blues. Black preacher in Atlantic preached a sermon on him. I've got a little clip of that sermon. Uh, all kind of stuff happened. Sylvester used to send turkeys to, to President Roosevelt to Warm Springs as a thank you. What's been the reception thus far? I know the reviews, the critical reviews have been fantastic. You know, I, every time I look up, somebody else important is writing about this book. So congratulate yeah, well, on that. But I'm also interested on in the reception that you're getting right. publicly, too, from the people right. who show up at the signings or people right. who write to you and things like it's that. It's been incredible. But what's been amazing, and this was a surprise to me, but part of how I framed this, like we had 425 people on a cold night during COVID last February in Mississippi, where the pictures came from. 425 people came out in a town that's got 25,000 population and then, you know, maybe another 30,000, 40,000 in the county. But so they were there. And I, I said to them, regardless of your religious beliefs, your background, your ethnicity, your identity, your class, your gender, whatever, I'm just inviting you to look at these pictures. And what I did when at the book signings, I would sign the book and I would say, look, exclamation point, slow down, exclamation point, discover, exclamation point. And so I told the folks that first night, I said, just find one picture where you can enter into it and see how that connects. Do you taste something? Do you smell something? Do you hear something in the picture? Do you What do you see? Does something touch your heart in the way that William Faulkner spoke, spoke about the human heart in conflict with itself? And people, and I'm saying no matter whether they're on the left, the right, the middle, in between, or nowhere around, they responded to the pictures. Mm. You mentioned which I thought was fascinating about the photographer uh, Pruitt himself and, and being in service of different kinds of conflicting constituencies or ideologies even. 
He was a white man who photographed both black life and white life. That's unusual in the American South for a small town photographer or a photographer anywhere in the United States during that time period. I mean, certainly photographers like black photographer like Gordon Parks, you know, he photo he moved in all worlds. But for a small town photographer in the South, not very many of them photographed both black life and white life. But Pruitt was there to get Pruitt it. Was there. But I have a and question made- for you. Where, where are you taking your book? Where are you going next? Tell me, you know, because I'm running out of time here. But I want to make sure this is a beautiful, beautiful book. It's a long time in the making. I had no idea that it went back that long, uh, Berkeley, your, your, your research. So bravo, you know. Uh, but where are you going next? And, you know, well, how do people find was- it? Well, the book is available at independent bookstores and also on that really big bookstore that's online. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that one, and yes. The exhibit was in Mississippi, uh, and then it was in Missouri at the State Historical Society, and then at the yes. Missouri School of Journalism. Yes. Uh, and now it's kind of like the bow weevil. The bow weevil is always looking for a home, you know. <laughs> just looking- because it roamed around after it crossed the border from Mexico into Texas. But so the exhibit is looking for a home oh. right now. We have some potential places where yeah, it's going to go. I'm sure it's uh, going to find it's going to find a home. I have no doubt about that. You but know, there are 100 photographs that are beautifully done by one of the world's foremost uh, exhibit designers, curatorial in Pasadena. And my mentors include Bill Ferris, who was the head of the National Endowment for Humanities, who calls the collection a national treasure. Another of my mentors was Deborah Willis, who's considered the expert globally on on black photography, uh, who's been a mentor of mine since she was my teacher at UNC in Chapel Hill. Um, And so I'm really excited about it. What's been amazing is, is, yes, people from Brazil looked at the pictures and they made connections to the black diaspora Mm -hmm. that came to Brazil. One of the, you know, had the most enslaved people of any place uh, you know, in, in the West. Um, and, and they they made connections. I had a graduate student from Syria who made connections with his life in Syria when he looked at the pictures. Wow. And that happens when you do what I say. You look, you slow down, wow. you discover. In an Instagram world where we scroll, 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 but do we look? Do we mm. slow down? Do we wow. discover? Thank you. What a note. That's the way to end this. Okay. I appreciate you. We're going to discover. We're going to discover, you know, and uh, trouble and resilience. That is the, that's the, 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 the subtitle of Owen Pruitt's Possum Town. And the author is Berkeley Hudson. Thank you, Berkeley. Thank you.